Secondary schools. I am Charlene Hicks Rayburn, principal of Barataria South Secondary School, Trinidad, and an executive member of APS TNT. This program is made possible through the very tech savvy team of RSC, Restore a Sense of ICANN. I have the pleasure to welcome on board to our growing dynamic. CAPS Thoughtful Thursday team, our St. Lucian colleagues, with our moderators for this evening, Ms. Marva Daniels and Mr. Wint Be Wayne Benty. I recall my visit to the beautiful Isle of St. Lucian with its majestic Mont Piton and Sulphur Springs, which would be quite ideal for us all at this time. Very busy, hectic schedule, I'm sure you all agree. Also, we at this time in the Caribbean, as educators must truly celebrate and embrace the natural beauty around us while adopting the skills in our professional realm that transforms us into the digitally savvy instructional leaders we are called to be. We look forward to some tips on how this can be achieved for this evening's program. I now turn you for me. to Miss Daniel. Good evening, Marva Oswe. Good evening, Charlene. Good evening, Team Caps. Bonsoir. Buenvenido. I am Marva Daniel, principal of the Castries Comprehensive Secondary School in St. Lucia, the second largest on the island. And with me is my co-moderator. I am Wayne Benty, vice principal of the Babono Secondary School, right here in St. Lucia. Our colleagues, why are we here this evening? And why this apt theme, a digitally savvy instructional leader? Research reinforces how critical principles are to student success. But we are also told and we have read how actions and behaviors associate to us being stellar leaders. And so this evening, one such behavior has been highlighted or action. And this is for us as colleagues, as leaders, instructional leaders, to remain au courant with modern trends that certainly assist us to effectively lead the process of instruction, a process that demands quality instruction, and of course, to effect quality, monitoring, supervision, and collaboration. Thanks to this crisis renaissance, our mode of instruction has been and continues to be primarily via digital modes. Thus, Integrating digital leadership is quite imperative if we as instructional leaders are to be impactful and positive at motivating leaders, learners, and of course, as resilient instructional leaders that we are, we have embraced 
this te the technology and continue to become digitally savvy instructional leaders. Don't you agree, Benzi? Certainly, Marva. So now, colleagues, we're going to spend 10 minutes in the breakout room. And our topic for discussion is what strategies can be used to monitor and support teachers in the online environment. So we now move to our breakout rooms. Mamfa, are we back in the main room? So, hi, good evening, everyone. Mamfa, over to you. Good evening. Yes, good evening, everyone. Welcome back to our main platform. And it was just awesome being in the plat in the different breakout rooms, Benzie. Yeah. I'm not sure what the other facilitators found out, but I know I definitely learned a lot. Yes, and so the best practices, we had persons as far north as Belize and all the way down to Trinidad, Arima, Coover, all the places we've been to and know. So um, we just like to thank everybody for participating. And that's important. Breakout rooms are to not just speak but to get to know each other and what this confirmed was that we are digitally savvy leaders we heard all the jargon that we are used to connectivity synchronous learning asynchronous learning and persons are engaging persons are interacting we have a lot of collaborations lots of plcs and persons learning from these um at these activities in within this their, their, their different departments to, to um, inform decisions. And so we have platforms being used such as Moodle, Zoom, Google Meet, um, Microsoft Teams. And I'm jealous because I heard some, some person speak about every single, every single child in their school, at their school, have devices. Oh my Asana God. Asana Barbados. Asana Barbados. Asana Barbados. Yeah. Jesus, when will we get there? I hope soon. <laughs> so our chief is on, I hope, and we are getting there. We're getting there. So um, of course, having the tools are essential. Without the tools, you can't be effective. And so we are getting the feel that our, our, our leaders, our, instruct, our instruction is driven by quality technology that we all need for the entire process of instruction. So this is it, and we thank everybody for yeah. engaging. And I'm sure that we got to, to, to meet a lot of people across the island. Yeah. The islands. Thank you. Yeah. So now, Benji, what are we moving on to? Well, it's time for that. You know, I had this yeah. one hour thing, you know. I really wish we had more time, but colleagues, we have to move on. So what's our next move on the agenda? Mm -hmm. It's time to hear from a president. So it's... Oh, my God, we have some wonderful presidents. Who's our president for tonight? Ah, so... Just listen on your... Oh, I'm, I'm attentive. Yes. <laughs> All right. So um, to present the presidential thoughts, I am honored and deeply honored to introduce Ms. Rita Carty, who is the principal of the Alberna Lake Hodge Comprehensive School and president of the Anguilla's President Association, Principals Association. Ms. Carty holds a degree in applied educational leadership and management with distinction. She's also an, an accomplished poet and a literary critic. And I went, when I was doing some research on her in, in St. Martin, there was some work she did there and that was just awesome. But you have to go and do some reading on your own. <laughs> Ms. Uh, Ms. Carty is indeed unwavering in her commitment to her school. She works so hard to achieve the vision she perceived, and she's positive, warm. And what I like about Ms. McCarthy, where learning is concerned, she's truly, um, she's valued and creative, and she's innovative to the norms and the new things that is emerging. She's in digitally savvy. Right. So welcome, Ms. Celestine McCarthy. Oh, God. Good 
Good evening all. Instructional leadership in a technological age during a pandemic. Is that the very definition of the word challenge? It could very well be. Here we are at a new frontier with a new breed of clients charged with ensuring that they are prepared for contexts that we cannot foresee using tools that we are now learning to manipulate but that these clients have never lived without. How do we do this? As principals, we must start with ourselves. The call is for us to adopt a professional growth mindset and model the virtue of lifelong learning. We must be that example for our staff and for our students. Many members of staff have lost their equilibrium faced with a wide array of digital tools and a whole menu of ways to use them. We certainly understand how they feel. Even as we model this growth mindset, we have to be strategic and not neglect to integrate the components of sustainability and long-term well-being. The times of being overwhelmed will pass. We should be still standing at the end. Modeling that growth mindset would help our teachers as we apply adult learning theory to help them develop their own capacity and comfort level with the new modes of instruction that we are compelled to employ because of the pandemic, but really that we should be embracing because of the reality of this new age. Facilitating job embedded learning for members of staff becomes a much easier sell when they see how much we are willing to adjust ourselves. The digital tools at our disposal must also be leveraged to enhance collaboration and communication. They must transform the landscape of administration as much as they have the delivery of instruction. For this, we can draw inspiration from this very body the Caribbean Association of Principals of Secondary Schools. Look at what we have been able to achieve since June 2020. At the end of this pandemic, we would not only have survived the moment and managed to perform within it, but we would have used this moment of crisis to propel us forward, coming out stronger and better equipped on the other side. And so, as we participate in this session of Thoughtful Thursday, let us focus on our power as instructional leaders and the opportunity this moment affords us to leverage that power in the interest of the institutions that we lead. presidential thought and it's not it's not just a thought you know Benzi it's a challenge to each and every one of us and Miss Cathy ensured that we were reminded of the need to continue to be exemplary lifelong learners this new frontier that I earlier referred to as the crisis renaissance ensures and propelled us into this world, or how would I say this? A different realm of leading, and of course, in, in, in at the same time, what he has shown is that we have, of course, to portray a growth mindset that will, of course, facilitate productive learning, and of course, ensuring that we survive this moment of crisis. Awesome. Thank you so much, Miss Cathy. And I'm certain that every single one of us on this platform, 127 of us, have learned from your presentation and considered this presidential thought 
impactful. Thank you very much. Quite poetic. Quite poetic. Yes. <laughs> so, Fenty. Mm -hmm. According to the script, we're supposed to be moving to the moment of movement. Could you imagine this? Mm -hmm. We have seen, we have heard so many sessions and whatever. So what's happening this evening? What is Elusha presenting ah. as our moment of movement? Okay, so it's St. Lucia sounds, St. Lucia movement, and it's performed by educators right here from St. Lucia. And we had a cultural group, the flamboyant dancers. However, we just want you to just Enjoy the difference and look out for my co-host somewhere in there. So, moment of movement. But most importantly, oh, what I was saying to you in the moment of movement, when I sunrise, I was to not. <laughs> of a difference that we know that we can do. And so we've had a fusion of all our cultural dance moves and of course sounds, as you heard, um, from our um, dame 
queen of culture, says Descartes. And so one thing I need you to remember is that research has proven that dancing, <clears throat> unlike all other activities, exercises, or whatever it is that we do, has been un has been proven to reduce or even re um, eradicate the onset of Alzheimer's and dementia. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it's because you have to remember you know, there, yeah. And so dancing, let us continue to dance. Whether it's at home, you could play this thing back. It helps reduce stress, which we are all experiencing at this time. It increases our energy levels, improves our strength and conditions our body. So why have we stopped dancing, even if we're in Lent, okay? We can dance on Sundays, you know, our little Easter's as Catholics see. So I hope everybody that you participated and that you continue to engage in dancing, especially from tonight's moment of movement. <laughs> so we move right along. Wow, we've moved to our presidential thought. We've moved away from this, we've moved to momentum movement, mm -hmm. and now we are going to present what everybody has been waiting for. Our guest speaker or our main presenter. And so this evening, it gives me great pleasure to introduce to those of you who don't know, everybody in St. Lucia knows Mr. Roy Stan Emanuel. He, of course, is quite prolific and an avid, educational technology teacher or officer. He currently lectures at Arthur's Community College in technology and education, digital media, and he also trains persons in digital literacy. Mr. Emmanuel specializes in instructional design and technology, adult learning, and he has so many skills, Mr. Benty. This gentleman is so diverse in his ability to interact with persons on the internet. He has skills in Moodle administration, mobile app developer. CAPS, we should, um, we should really take advantage of him to have our own CAPS app for all, all colleagues around the entire region. And so Mr. Emmanuel Daly promotes the belief that technology has the potential to shift the mindset of educational supervisors and aptly presents the nexus between educational supervision and digital leadership. Who best to engage us for the next 10 to 12 minutes? Presenting the digitally savvy instructional leader through the use of quality analytics. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, Mr. Royston Emanuel. Good evening, everyone. And I, I thank you for this overwhelming introduction. I didn't know I was, I was so many things, <laughs> um, but I won't waste so much time into talking about all of, all of this. Um, I, I need to go directly into what we, we came here to talk about. My presentation this evening is on how we can leverage learning analytics as um, educational leaders at, at our institutions. And you know, um, one of the fortunate side effects of the COVID-19 pandemic is that transition to online modalities for instruction. And therefore, what that has done is opened up the opportunities to use data to start making some really sound decisions. So, so, so the emphasis here is that is really on, you, on using learning analytics, um, which is the basis of data-driven decision-making. So let's start with um, the, the rationale. This is the rationale for um, using learning analytics. It's clear that when educational institutions realize their full, the full value of their data, everyone is empowered because we're using facts, we're using metrics, we're using data to guide decisions. Learners can now make decisions about their, the competencies they've reached, their learning paths, the times they learn, the environments, their, their course loads. And of course, teachers have a way better understanding of um, learner engagement in courses. Administrators 
um, when they engage in the use of learning analytics can now make decisions about the effectiveness of instruction, staffing needs, and um, what institutional interventions are needed. But as it stands, this is where we are. Our learners make a lot of decisions based on, on grades in, in courses and subjects and on teacher feedback. And you know, because of the large size of classes, et cetera, um, it becomes very difficult to, to provide that kind of intimate feedback that, that students really need. So what we also know is that our learners are responsible for connecting sometimes disparate sources of data on their engagement and their performance. So um, they get scores in an assignment done, a test done. Um, they, they get feedback from the teacher on, on how well they perform the task. And it is their responsibility now to collect, connect all of these. And, and, and there is no actual platform for doing that. When it comes to teachers, we, we, we know that teachers make a lot of decisions based on anecdotal evidence. What other teachers see, what, what, what they believe, what people see. All right, um, we make a lot of decisions based on student summative scores and that is fine. But at the same time, are there opportunities for us to um, generate data that, that more or less gives us a sense of how the student is getting there. So we make decisions on attendance records um, and if that, that, is, if that is taken consistently. And if we do have subject or course evaluations, this supports our decision making, which is fine, but it really can't take us to the next level. And as for administrators, we need to ask a question. And, and, and I put a, a question mark at deliberately because you are administrators and I need you to reflect on how do I make my decisions? Um, what is the data that guides what I, what, what I decide? Um, what interventions that I bring into play at, in my institution? So in thinking about that, you need to ask yourself, is your data disaggregated? meaning that it comes from different sources and are not connected. Is your data static? Meaning that data only means something at that point in time. It, 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 it does not respond to change, etc. cetera. Um, is, is, is your data not focused on change, on, on growth or responding, okay? Is it simply focused on giving a snapshot of the now? And importantly now, is your data really providing, you know, how all the parts within your institution is connected? And when we talk about parts, we're not just talking about student teachers, we're talking about processes as well, teaching, learning processes, interventions, parental involvement, access, um, not just who, um, who has access, but where they have access, at what times do they have access? All of these become critical, especially because of the distributed learning that we are engaging in now. So, this is part of the wonderful side effect of COVID-19, that a lot of institutions, and I heard it from the breakout rooms, have moved towards using platforms that support uh, blended learning approaches or totally online learning approaches, okay? So we have moved into using learning management systems like Moodle, like um, Google Workspace, okay? Some of us call it G Suite for Education, but, um, but now it has evolved into Google Workspace as a response to COVID-19. Some of us use Notes Master, Khan Academy, all those different platforms. But the point is, um, there is something wonderful that is available in those platforms. And, and we need to ask ourselves, are we taking advantage of that? What is available? Learning analytics, okay? Learning analytics, guys, is the measurement, the collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their context. And we do that not for reporting sake, but for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. And the context, the concept of environments become critical. It's not just the learner, it's not whether they have access, it's where, it's when, it's how. These are critical issues as well, okay? So what I want to do is just spend some, some time looking at what we have access to. If you are using Google Workspace, there are many add-ons and tools you have access to. Classroom Manager is an excellent tool that allows you, the administrator, to generate reports on student engagement in the different classes. So you can, you can generate reports on teacher access, on student access, on assignment um, submission, okay? We also have attendance report that allows students to actually tick, you know, the, the um, whether they, um, that they're present when they enter the Google Classroom. Or those same attendance report actually are automatically generated 
when students are engaged in a, in, in a live session using Google Meet. Then there is Flubaru. This is an excellent tool that actually takes assessment data from the quizzes that are put on in Google Classrooms and it actually does the item analysis. Okay, so you, you, you know which question was answered best, you know which question was answered worst, you, 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 you get all that data, you get your facility index and all, those, all, all that data. And then there are SCOM reports. A lot of, there are a lot of tools online that allow teachers to organize their content in the form of SCOM. And the SCOM reports actually gives you data on access, on completion, and all of those things, right? So um, there is roster sync, which is another excellent tool for pooling together um, who is teaching what, which teacher um, has access to which courses, okay? Then we have the grader report that, that brings together not just students' grades, but it, it, it gives you a sense of students' progress throughout the, um, the, the, the engagement in the classroom. And there is presence for it, which just like attendance report, generates those automatic attendance reports from those synchronous sessions that we may want to have. Now, there, there are a lot more, but I just want to whet your appetite to give you a sense of what is available as instructional leaders. Um, having your team look into those um, and making decisions about how well you can use them can really help you make some, um, make some sound interventions when it comes to what is happening in your context. For those of us who are using Moodle, and I just chose Google Classroom and Moodle because from um, research done, we realized that these were the two uh, most used um, um, learning management platforms. On Moodle, there are so many um, plugins available like course dedication, which gives you a sense of how long learners spend in a course, how long teachers spend in a course. It gives you, it gives you a sense of how many times they clicked on, 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 on a resource, on activity. There are reports and analytics, which will give you a sense of what is the most popular course. Um, it will give you a sense of what, um, what courses were, um, what percentage of courses were completed by students. Okay, um, there are SCOM reports, like I mentioned before. Um, there are greater reports, all of these can actually change the dynamics because they will give you some really rich data that points to what is happening, okay? Um, and so what you're trying to do is replace your decision-making from simply um, what you hear, what you see, to what you can connect, okay? And, and this is what those tools provide. So what does that mean for your data now? It means your data is connected. Because, because those historical divisions between data that usually exist at institutions are kind of blurred, okay? So you get um, data from, report from, from teacher reports. You get data from um, assignment scores. Okay, you get data from the skim books. You get data from the register. Is it possible that all of those things can be connected on one platform? And so instead of having to go and look for that data, you have access to all of that and you can generate the type of reports that help you make decisions about um, based on what is happening. Data is also dynamic in the sense that as things change, the, the, the data reflects that. So as um, students um, finish a course, that is reflected in your data. Okay, as more students enter the course, that is reflected in your data. As more new interventions come in, that is reflected in your data. And so you don't have to go and reinvent the wheel. But importantly too, data in that sense becomes an agent of change because you are using it to inform decisions. And data importantly becomes, um, a, um, a predict, becomes predictive because what you could do is develop models for decision-making. So if you realize that in a particular course, if you, if you are running it in the blended approach or online, if you, if you realize that, um, that when, you, when this course is running between, let's say, um, two o'clock and, and three o'clock in the afternoon, the attendance is poor because you do get that data. And even if you, even if you have um, um, relatively good attendance, maybe engagement is poor. Maybe students are not responding. Maybe students are not clicking. Then you can actually make decisions about maybe changing the time the course is run, looking at whether you could, you, you, you could shorten the duration of the teaching. These are, these are things that you could do. You could develop those predictive models. And most importantly, because the data is verifiable, because the data exists and you could go back to the platform, then definitely um, you can make sounder decisions. So I look at all of this 
And I just call it, you know, the process of humanizing pedagogy. And it might sound ironic because you're talking about technology, artificial intelligence, you know, um, humanizing pedagogy, but it does. Because for the first time, you can get individual snapshots of a student's learning experience. I keep telling people when I stand in a classroom and I look at 40 students, I'm looking at 40 students. I'm not looking at each individual student. But when I go online and I go to the data, I can tell when a student logged in, where they logged in from, how long they spent, and this is a snapshot. I can see their course completion. I can see their progress. I can see their greater progress. And this is a snapshot of that individual student. And this for me is a process of humanizing pedagogy, okay? And importantly, it's not just, I'm not the only one seeing it. The student is seeing it too. Traditionally, the student have to come to the teacher and ask, Miss, how am I doing? Do you think I'm doing well? The, if the student has access to the data, the student can actually see their progress. And that's why we use things like progress report and reports and those type of things that students have access to. So they get an understanding of how well they are doing. On the teacher end, the teacher now can monitor progress all the time. And like I said, when I stand in a classroom, I see 40 students. Online, I see each individual student. And I, cannot, I, I don't just get the opportunity to monitor the progress. There's an the opportunity to intervene. And that is important, okay? The teacher has data on attendance, but more importantly, it's not just that whether the student was present or not, we also get data on how did the student display that presence? What resources did the students go to? How, how long did they spend on the platform? How long did they spend in, the, in, 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 in this in-corner session, right? Um, we get information on engagement. How did they interact with those resources? Did they complete? Did they answer questions? And of course, one of the things that learning analytics is when it has done quite well for us is that it provides data on at-risk at students, okay? So if a student is not accessing the, the data, the learning analytics will naturally generate a, a report to let you know there are some students who are at risk, okay? So, so, so in summary, the concept of, you know, just, just using, learning analytics to drive our decisions. That concept of, 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 of humanizing pedagogy, what it does is that it, it, it provides us with data that is responsive and then can, that therefore can support decision-making. It, it, it provides us with reliable data. It's consistent throughout. It's not that anecdotal. It's not what the, the teacher thinks or how the teacher has interpreted students' actions. And of course, it's valid in the sense that we know exactly what we're measuring. So I know I'm rushing through this thing, but I have a time limit. So the important question is, where are we? Okay. My question to you, things you have to think about, do we have access to data? Do, do you have that access to that data? And if you don't, it means we need to have start having a conversation about what are the tools I can have my, my system admin, the ministry, my, my, my IT teacher, right? Um, add to the platforms in order for us to get that data. But then importantly, are we ready to engage in very important processes like sensitization? Students must understand the importance of that data. Teachers must understand the importance of that data. Parents must understand that. And importantly, administrators beyond principals, we're talking about people in the ministry, must understand the importance of that data and how they can use that data in decision-making. Further to that, we need training. We need to expose education administrators and their support teams to, the, to training to understand how to apply that data in decision-making. And of course, something that has, has to happen is that we need to integrate processes. So teachers need to understand that the principal or, or your, your instructional lead must be part of your classroom, must have access to that data, okay? So it's not simply about I teach, I report. It means, it means that teaching becomes, you know, a, a global process that everybody is a part of because we integrate in processes. And finally, my question to you is, do we have a positive attitude towards this? Do we see it as more work? Yes, it is, but do we see it as important? And my answer is so definitely, yes, it is. Thank you very much, guys. Your thoughts, any questions? I have a very quiet room. <laughs> Madam Moderator and Mr. Moderator, are we open for questions? 
Hi, yes, good evening. I am waiting for my <laughs> St. Lucia. I hope they're not dancing out. They've gone dancing. <laughs> but we have one I'm seeing in the chat here, which I would start with. Mm. Are the add-ons listed for Google available in the free G Suite? Okay, that's a very good question. The add-ons are available. Um, some of them are what we call um, freemium, freemium models. They work on freemium models, meaning that you have, you have access to certain um, analytics and that's fine. And, and if you want to go further, um, you need to pay a small fee. Most of this is about $5 or $15 a year. Um, but the point is um, G Suite, which is now Google Workspace, um, has made those tools available for you. So, it's a, so um, if you do have administrative access, you can activate those add-ons, but they are domain specific. So it means that um, you should be part of a school domain in order to, to add these on, okay? But they are available and they are available either free or free but limited, okay? Thank yes. Thank you very much. Mama, do you have an, a question or you would like me to continue? I can go ahead. Let me go on. So too often, there's a top-down approach to data gathering and provisions of data to MOE. How can we as administrators use and provide data to enrich decision-making within the MOE? So more like a okay. bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. What do you think? But if it but uh, using learning analytics is actually de democratizing, you know, data, the use of data, the application of data. In the first place, data starts with the practitioner, but it doesn't mean that the ministry or administrators need to wait for the data because the data, because once you're part of the domain, you have access to the data. And so that's what I meant by integrating processes that we do not have to segregate, you know, the channels for data collection. So it means in St. Lucia, for instance, because the ministry runs the Google Workspace domain, um, you can have a team responsible for using, for accessing and using the data, okay? Um, because the data is readily available for that, to that team. So really and truly, there, there is no hierarchy anymore. Anybody who has the rights to access can access that data. And so that decision is really based on what the schools want, what the ministries want. Thank you very much. Well, I Hope think, unfortunately, in our territory, data may become a, one of the uh, an ugly word because we are we seem to be bombarded by the request for such, and streamlining will definitely, you know, bring it to to make it more manageable. We see the importance of it, but it's it's uh, doing that transition. You know, sometimes it's a uh, it can be quite laborious, right? I'm going on. Let's. Um, I'm seeing another question in our chat here. Is there a guide to the analysis of the facts that are presented so that the intervention are less subjective and more valid? I repeat. You want me to repeat? The I, question? I would think yes. Um, yeah, I, 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 I got it. Um, there are ways of using data effectively and, and the use of data effectively is based on, on sound principles of research, scientific principles, application of, application of data in research, okay? But there are um, a lot of open educational resources that actually, sub, that, that actually help prepare teachers and administrators for using that data, okay? Um, again, it's also a, a community approach where, where, where the principals and ministry decides, okay, what are the guidelines for using that data? So somebody may have an issue with, um, you know, why am I collecting data on students and I don't have parental permission, et cetera. But the guidelines can cover that because the ministry, the schools are the gatekeepers of that data in the first place. And so do we really need permission? Okay, how we apply that data? How do we interpret that data? What, are the, what does that data mean? Um, it's always objective. It can't ever be subjective. And so the, and so the guidelines would, would really just cover access, who has access, when, when we access, what are the intervals, um, that, um, what, are the, what are the intervals we use to generate the data 
okay, and what are those, what are those intervals do we generally report and therefore apply that data to making decisions. Um, I hope you heard me, there was some noise. Yes, I heard, <laughs> we had a little feedback, um, but I think yes, our participants yes, got yes. Um, the gist of what mm -hmm. you have been saying. I think we have time mm -hmm. for one more question. I would like to take another question from the chat because this topic seems to have really caught everyone's attention. I'm seeing here a question from, it seems to, it seems to me that we need some training as administrators in the effective use of this type of data and analytics. What are some of your suggestions for MOE um, in terms of training? How can MOE engage schools in this training? Well, the, like I said, a wonderful side effect of COVID-19 is, is what we're doing right now. And so we have embraced a new modality of, of collaboration. And so that can be used for further training. Um, there is no reason principals yeah. across the Caribbean cannot come together on the same platform to engage in training on using learn, learning analytics. Um, I know um, that at our institution, SLCC, we, 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 do, we do a lot of training in ICT integration in the use of OERs and the use of platforms, and, and, and we do cover some of the learning analytics. But even online, there are free um, to use courses, open courses available. Um, the Commonwealth of Learning provides quite a bit of this, um, and we have partnered with them for a very long time. So, so they provide training in this area, but even on, on, on platforms like edX and Coursera, and even um, on LinkedIn, there are um, readily available courses in using learning analytics. Learning analytics is, is nothing new. It has been there forever. Um, it has been there in different formats, but more than ever, it is now um, something that is quite important because for the first time, we have almost 80% of our students operating on that online platform. Perfect opportunity to, to understand our learners. Thank you very much. Okay, so Mava, are you able to join us yes. now? Yeah, we can join you. I have a question. Yes. yes. Um, yes. Are, are all colleagues aware of the age limit for certain platforms as we have embraced this you know, digital realm of teaching and learning. Um, I'm not certain that even parents know that there's an age limit for students to engage on Facebook and YouTube. And teachers do use these platforms to, to, to um, engage with students. So um, what do you offer as an alternative, Mr. Mr. Emmanuel? Because I know the age limit is 13 years old. Mm. Um, I have made it clear anytime I speak that WhatsApp, Facebook, and those social media platforms are not ideal when it comes to instruction. They are far from ideal. Yes. They are social spaces and they are intrusive spaces. Mm -hmm. My recommendation has always been that the schools and the ministry decide on and invest in an, uh, a learning management system that, sub that is designed exactly because of its name for learning. And that system has all the tools for communication, for interaction, and all of those things. Okay, um, what I have done in the past is always, I have put together tools that teachers can use, right, to communicate with students, much like they would have, would have used with WhatsApp. But this, these tools do not require telephone numbers, um, nor do they require some, some statuses and all those type of things, so they're not intrusive. But the point is, if we're using a, 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 a learning management system, and we understand that those platforms work on the principle of mobile first, meaning they are designed for portable devices, then we should not have a problem. Okay, students and parents should not have a problem interacting. I'm working in certain schools right now, and as soon as they realize the power of Google Workspace, things change. The teacher's attitudes change. The parents, a parent met me at the supermarket and said, you know something, you must be involved in that. And I asked her why. She said, because when I look at the resources created, and I look at my child's reaction, I'm realizing that there is some in, in informed intervention here. And it's not really, I won't call it informed intervention. I just call it, I'm um, just, just making sense of what is available. What we learned from the COVID experience, and I did some extensive research on what happened in the OECS, is that there were 16 different platforms used 
and sometimes in, in one school there were five, six, seven, eight platforms. Oh, and I mean, that caused some serious dissonance, extreme dissonance, because one child in a class of six teachers had to use six different platforms. Yes. Right, notwithstanding, the child has siblings, the child has to understand this thing, the child has to learn the platform. And so it is yes, and the, parent, and the parents too who have to do the monitoring at home. Mr. Emmanuel, exactly. we, 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 we wish we could continue all night. And I, I do hope that you are going to, to become a principal to join CAPS because we need that kind of expertise. <laughs> Why is it better? <laughs> so, so thank you so much, Mr. Emmanuel. Thank you. Thank you. That was so thought provoking. And based on the questions coming out from the, um, the group, that means your, your PowerPoint presentation, your presentation reached. It reached. And what, what I want to take from that is that learning analytics is important. Very and much. so when we, we what and it's what we do with the data as instructional leaders as important. And data drives everything. And and, and you know, when we when we speak to um, where we at as um, leaders, I think because we are in a reflective job and in a reflective practice, we must always remember, as you say that, and humanize the pedagogy. So in that workspace or in the platform, online platform, we are seeing the children as individuals as opposed to in the classroom. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts. So once again, so thank you so much. And viewers, your responsibility now is to complete the feedback forms. Please do not leave this evening if you don't do this. Please go to the chat, the link is there, just click on it and please complete. This really drives in, in, in information yes. um, and, and assist CAPS, you know, to improve and generally, you know, to know how, you know how persons feel. So as the curtains close on season two, we have to say goodbye. <laughs> and season two, session nine ends with us saying very profoundly, thanks to all our colleagues from all over the Caribbean who have remained, you have registered and remain with us for this entire and interesting, thoughtful Thursday hour. We thank you and hope that we have evoked positive thoughts that will further enhance our digital leadership skills and at the same time of course we do hope that we have enabled you to reduce some stress and of course through our moment of movement you are now even more fitter as digital leaders and so next week our colleague mrs martina belize presents managing your finances as digitally savvy instructional leaders especially now during this crisis renaissance Thank you, merci, bon, 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 bon soir tout le monde. Thank you very much.